Good morning, everybody. Can we restart the session? Thank you very much. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's session on the newly created UN Network on Migration. And uh, my honor and a, a real pleasure to welcome Special Representative of the Secretary General for International Migration, Ms. Louise Arbour, a very good friend of all of us, as well as IOM's Independent Civil Society Liaison, Colin Raja. As you know, uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, foreshadowed in his report on, of January 2018, Making Migration Work for All, the contribution of the United Nations of the development of the Global Compact for Safe, Regular and Orderly Migration, that he would initiate internal consultation on how best to configure the United Nations system, including IOM, to coordinate the actions of the UN on migration. Secretary General Guterres expressed his commitment to ensure that the UN system is fully positioned to respond promptly and effectively in supporting implementation of the Global Compact once it was adopted. He indicated that he placed a premium on drawing on existing expertise, ensuring operational deliverables in response to the needs of member states and ensuring efficiency. The, um, efficiency. Secretary General Guterres indicated that the outcomes from these consultations would have to be fully consistent with his development and management reforms uh, and be aligned with the UN's work on the Sustainable Development Goals. In line with his proposal for reform of the UN development system, he insisted that facilitating delivery on the ground be the litmus test of our efforts. In the development context, migration is already fully integrated into the Sustainable Development Goals. The Secretary General committed to explore how member states of the UN family can jointly offer tailored assistance to member to teams at the request of member states. He noted that with the 2016 agreement to bring IOM into the United Nations system as a related organization, acknowledging obviously its role as the global lead agency in the field of migration, there is now an opportunity to develop this relationship further and to better integrate the competences of IOM into the broader United Nations system so as to support the efforts of member states on migration-related issues. The Director General, myself, and my colleagues at IOM are deeply honored by the Secretary General's decision following the above-referenced consultation to establish a new UN network on migration and to design, the, uh, designate IOM as its coordinator and secretariat. This is a designation which IOM takes very seriously and which I believe reflects the views you, IOM member states, clearly express both in bringing IOM into the UN system and the broader need for greater coherence on migration within the UN system. IOM is fully committed to carrying out its new responsibility in a full spirit of collaboration with the many entities within the UN system with mandates, expertise, and experience to bring to the table on migration, and in doing so, to work in lockstep with the members of the newly formed Executive Committee of the Network, ILO, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees, UNDP, UNICEF, and the UN on Drugs and Crime, and UNDESA plus IOM. I see IOM's role as one of galvanizing the full capacities of the UN system at national, regional, and global level to support member states on migration and to better protect and assist migrants throughout the world. IOM has been working tirelessly with 
Special Representative Arbour and her team, as well as with the other members of the Executive Committee since the conclusion of the Global Compact negotiations in July, up to, through, and since the UN Network Framing Meeting in October here in Geneva to develop terms of reference and working modalities for the network. Before entering into a deeper discussion on IOM's foreseen role, it is my pleasure to welcome a special representative Arbu, who has been providing inspired leadership to the UN system's effort since appointed to this position, and to invite her to share with you her reflections on the UN network now and into the future. Madame Arbu, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here with you today on this, uh, I understand, 109th session of the IOM Council, and especially at a time where the UN system is embarking on a historic course of collectively taking action on the many aspects of migration, migration as we understand it today. From the outset, and at the risk of stating the obvious, I would like to emphasize that migration uh, with all its complexities, presents us with well-documented opportunities as well as well-documented challenges. But before I go on, please allow me to briefly recap a chronology of important events that have taken us to where we are today. I know that you're familiar with the considerable scale and variety of occurrences in cross-border migration, particularly in recent times. The news cycles actually bring us seemingly endless accounts of people on the move, albeit often reporting mostly on the human tragedies that are associated with this. this there has also been an increased attention within the UN paid to migration's many dimensions, but for the most part, and certainly until recently, the offices making up the UN system have dealt with these issues within the ambit of their respective mandates and institutional priorities. In 2006, the Global Migration Group was established by the then Secretary General following a recommendation from the Global Commission on International Migration to form a high-level inter-institutional group of UN entities involved in migration-related activities. The Global Migration Group had a broad mission it was to promote the wider application of all relevant international and regional instruments and norms relating to migration, and to encourage the adoption of comprehensive and better coordinated approaches to the issue of international migration. As the GMG set out to pursue these objectives, it had to deal with some shortcomings. For one, it was not rooted in a member state's mandate, and secondly, by its very nature, it was a loose coordination mechanism and therefore inevitably had limited effectiveness. Then came the events on Europe's borders in 2015, which eventually precipitated a more urgent call for global action on migration. The stress caused by large-scale movements of people was further compounded by the fact that while many came seeking asylum as refugees, many others were simply fleeing various forms of severe hardship and seeking a better life. As you know, on July 16, member states of the UN through the General Assembly, sorry, on in July 2016, member states of the General Assembly unanimous, unanimously adopted a, resu a resolution making IOM a related organization to the UN. Uh, this formalized, I think, was clearly already a very close relationship between IOM and the United Nations. The agreement, though, served to strengthen existing cooperation and enhance the ability of both IOM and the other relevant UN entities to fulfill their respective mandates in the best interest of migrants and, of course, of member states. Through the agreement, the UN recognizes IOM as an indispensable actor in the field of human mobility. A few months later, in September of 2016, the UN General Assembly unanimously adopted the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. 
The New York Declaration carried with it a wide range of undertakings by member states to strengthen and enhance mechanisms to protect people on the move. It has paved the way for the adoption of, as you know, the two new global compacts in 2018, a global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration, which will be formally adopted in Marrakesh in December, and a global compact on refugees. The adoption of the New York Declaration and IOMs joining the UN system have served as impetus for the Secretary General to advance the agenda of modernizing the way in which the UN system supports member states on all aspects of international migration. In his report in January of this year, Making Migration Work for All, the Secretary General called for the creation of the UN Network on Migration that would effectively succeed the Global Migration Group. On the 13th of July this year, member states came to an agreement on the text of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. It is, as you know, and has been often repeated, a non-legally binding document, and therefore no new legal obligations arise under domestic or international law for participating states. The text is an agreed outcome from the very extensive intergovernmental negotiations and it's for each state to determine its next steps. The aim of the Global Compact is neither to stop nor to encourage migration. Rather, it is to facilitate safe, orderly, and regular mobility. The Global Compact calls upon the UN system to support member states as they further shape their own migration policies and their own plans for implementation. In particular, the Global Compact welcomes the Secretary General's proposal to create the network. I will elaborate on the network in a moment, but I want to make the following point very clear. Irrespective of the Global Compact, IOMs coming into the UN system meant that it had to be expected to assume a larger coordinating role on migration-related activities. The Compact reaffirms this reality and actually provides a useful blueprint for the types of coordinating activities that member states are likely to require from the UN system. Many, if not all of you, are familiar with these developments, but I wanted to present them to provide a context, not just on what brought us here, but also on the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. So now let me turn, if I may, to the UN Network on Migration and maybe give you a little bit more details about its constitution and, op and proposed operations. Paragraph 45 of the Global Compact expressly welcomes the decision of the Secretary General to establish this UN Network on Migration. The network represents a clear manifestation of the collective commitment by the UN to promote overall coherence on migration activities. The Secretary General's vision in one is one that is shared among UN entities and an overwhelming majority of member states. Just this October, members of the network and representatives from various stakeholders met here in Geneva to finalize and to adopt its terms of reference. The meeting also culminated in the formal activation of the network as called for by the Secretary General's decision. This important step was preceded by months of intense collaboration amongst members of a preparatory group, a group that was made out of representatives from UN entities that were named in the uh, New York Declaration. This rested on and actually reinforced a genuine cooperative spirit, which I believe will serve the network very well going forward. As noted by the Global Compact, the network shall fully draw from the technical expertise and experience of relevant entities within the United Nations system. This is in recognition of the important work done so far by these entities in uh, the areas of migrations that fall within their respective mandates while at the same time steering away from the siloed approaches of the past. 
The Global Compact is expressly anchored in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and as such, will also uh, ground the work of the network, of course, in the UN Charter and in an international law. The link with the SDGs is particularly important, not least because some characteristics of migration are inextricably linked with development. Remittances, for instance, is the most common uh, issue uh, that is referred to uh, as, as uh, an important link between migration and development, and one that, of course, impacts both countries of origin and destination. The network will be guided by a set of principles which are, are also a reflection of the values and ideas expressed by member states during the various rounds of negotiations. These include accountability, a human rights-based, gender-responsive, child-sensitive, and result-oriented approach, and a focus on coherence, a unity of purpose, efficiency, and inclusivity. Let me now turn to the membership of the network. It will consist of members of the UN system for whom migration is of relevance to their mandates and who wish to be part of it. Within the network, they will be an executive committee whose initial members are UN DESA, ILO, IOM, OHCHR, UNICEF, UNDP, UNHCR, and UNODC. This executive committee is tasked with providing overall guidance and setting strategic priorities to support member states as the latter determine their migration priorities and their next steps in light of the Global Compact. In addition to the entities in, ex in the executive committee, the network is presently comprised of a large number of other UN funds, programs, agencies, and offices, alongside with some of the coordination mechanisms, such as the IASC Secretariat, the Regional Economic Commissions, and the World Bank. I could actually uh, give you a full list of uh, the membership, but I think it, this list of acronyms would probably challenge your will to live. As called uh, it's called for by the Secretary General in his January report and acknowledged in the Global Compact, IOM will serve as the coordinator and the secretariat of the network. The uh, Director General of IOM or his or her designee will serve in that capacity as coordinator. Uh, Director General Vitorino, I think it's fair to say, has welcomed the opportunities and challenges that this task presents for IOM and has consistently uh, pledged support for the cohesion and inclusiveness that its members um, wish to see in the network. Some of the most important work of the network will be done through its working groups. The composition of working groups will be drawn not just from the executive committee, but from all members of the network, and in addition, from non-governmental partners, as may be relevant, similarly, in fact, to the way IASC operates in the humanitarian field. These working groups will focus on specific issues and on deliverables. IOM, of course, will serve again as secretariat for these working groups. The network fully aligns its work with existing coordinating mechanisms and the repositioning of the UN development system. That means not engaging in work that is already done very well by others. Again, I mentioned the humanitarian field where there is a robust existing coordination mechanism. At the country level, the network will seek to support the work of UN country teams as they face a range of migration-related issues. Let me touch briefly on another part of the network structure. The network will have a capacity-building mechanism as called for in the Global Compact. This will comprise three parts, and that's spelled out in the Compact itself. A startup fund, a connection hub, and a knowledge platform. The startup fund is intended to help start up or complement pre-existing projects to support member states 
in, Im in implementing the Global Compact. The Connection Hub will facilitate demand-driven, tailor-made, and integrated solutions by identifying main implementing partners within and outside the UN system and connecting requests to similar initiatives and solutions. The Global Knowledge Platform will serve as an online open data source for a repository of existing evidence, practices, and initiatives, and facilitate the accessibility to knowledge and the sharing of solutions. The network will place high priority on supporting member states as they embark on utilizing the compact in line with their national policies and priorities. In its DNA, the network will seek to be responsive as appropriate to calls for support, whether from member states, UN country teams, or other partners. For its next immediate steps, the network, through its executive committee, will focus on the development of its work plan, including the preliminary formation of some working groups. The network will also prioritize the further development of the capacity building mechanism and, of course, its eventual implementation. The Intergovernmental Conference in Marrakesh to adopt the Global Compact is a mere 12 days away. I hope that the conference will be an opportunity to exchange ideas for kick-starting practical efforts to implement the Compact. The Compact includes, as you know, suggestions for both short and long-term actions on the 23 objectives that uh, can be pursued in parallel. Governments, of course, will prioritize differently, but can work together to identify certain actions, either at the national, regional, or international levels, in order to capture some immediate practical benefits from the Global Compact. Many of the objectives in the Compact require bilateral, regional, or other forms of multilateral cooperation. Many also require the engagement of non-governmental stakeholders, including migrants themselves. The Compact allows us to see the connection between different levels of action on migration and link global cooperation to specific policies more clearly. I'm looking forward to hearing from member states and from other stakeholders about their ideas in the discussion that we will uh, that will be held in Marrakesh. I would like to assure you that members of the network are fully engaged in ensuring that it is appropriately prepared to take on its set of responsibilities, including facing challenges and pursuing opportunities as we usher in a new way of handling migration issues in a cohesive and coherent system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louise. And after uh, Colin's presentation, we will have the opportunity to ask, uh, you will have the opportunity to, to ask questions to, to, to Louise Arbo. So let me, let me move now to uh, our civil society liaison, Colin Raja, uh, who has guided IOM and helped uh, to ensure that civil society across the world uh, and from all different sectors are aware of and contribute with their deep knowledge and expertise to the member state development of the Global Compact. Colin, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General, and good morning to you, and as well as to you, uh, Ms. Arbor, Special Representative, uh, Excellencies and colleagues. I, I want to say at the outset of this what an honor it is for me to be sitting here on the panel with two incredibly um, powerful and very uh, open-minded and forward-thinking leaders uh, and, and two wonderful women I've been, had the pleasure of working with this last two years. Um, and also special thanks, I want to say at this outset, also to uh, Michelle Klein-Solomon and her team, the Global Compact team at IOM, as well as the IPD team, the International Partnership Division uh, in IOM, for the vision of including and, and really prioritizing civil society engagement throughout the Global Compact process and now uh, into the UN network as well. So a lot of the comments that I'll make here is driven by this experience in the last two years, but also looking forward beyond that as well. When the UN network was first announced in negotiations, uh, there was already high interest by civil society about what this would look like and what this would entail, and particularly where civil society engages with it. Uh, and that interest has only spiked and, and peaked even more uh, throughout the process and, and will 
be much more so going into Marrakesh and coming out of that. On its part, IOM held four open dialogues with civil society and other stakeholders uh, throughout the negotiation process this year, in-person open dialogues, uh, to engage around all things related both to IOM's work, but also specifically around the Global Compact. And then the last two really focused in on the UN network uh, in, in great detail and specificity. Out of the first few dialogues of these, we actually received a lot of recommendations and uh, inputs from civil society to convene a smaller working group looking just only at civil society and stakeholder engagement in the implementation, follow-up, and review of the Global Compact, as well as in the, in the UN network. And that working group convened uh, its first meeting in June, just before the June round of negotiations, um, as well as last month, on the 10th of October, the day after IDM, the International Dialogue on Migration here in Geneva, with a full day meeting and discussion just on the UN network in great detail. We had a lot of robust discussions on that. And that meeting uh, was not only with uh, IOM and IOM staff, but also with the executive committee uh, of the UN network and with the SRSG's office as well. We also have held two follow-up conference calls since that meeting in the past few weeks, and we'll convene one more follow-up meeting in Marrakesh itself in person uh, to again continue discussions and dialogue around the UN network. There have been other dialogues, of course, that IOM has convened, and specifically I want to mention the, the dialogues we've had with the regional working group, uh, civil society working group, uh, that convenes seven different focal points from around the world working in a regional level. Uh, and we've had one last meeting in July, round of the negotiations, again talking about the working group, uh, talking about the UN network and how implementation might happen uh, at the regional level and how engagement can happen with regional civil society bodies as well. The SRSG's office as well has had a series of briefings and convenings around the network with civil society and other stakeholders. Um, one of the more prominent one was in July. Uh, the, the special representative held herself with civil society around the July negotiations. And one just last week, last Tuesday, uh, that was held in a webinar format as well uh, so that civil society could engage from around the world. So a number of briefings from the SRSG's office as well. During the negotiations, the co-facilitators also held a series of dialogues with stakeholders in, during each round of the negotiations. And the last two or three of those, specific focus was given to the UN network. And in the very last round of negotiations and the final uh, closing plenary of the July negotiations, we had a series of stakeholders speak specifically about both the compact as well as the UN network. Other agencies, especially from the core group uh, or from the executive committee, have also held a series of discussions and meetings uh, with civil society and other stakeholders uh, around the UN network, OHCHR, ILO, UNICEF, and others as well. So this is just to give a snapshot on the breadth and the depth of information exchanges that we've had with civil society and other stakeholders around the UN network, as well as around the implementation, follow-up, and review of the Global Compact. So there's been a robust amount of this. And a lot of that has culminated in the framing meeting that uh, Madame Arbor had just mentioned a, a, mo a moment ago. On the second day of that framing meeting on the 16th of October, there was a special two-hour session dedicated uh, to stakeholders discussion around the UN network. We had 11 stakeholders that participated in this. Uh, one represented from the national human rights institutions, one from the trade unions, one from the private sector, one from academia, uh, and a few from uh, other civil society organizations as well. And from this meeting, I, I just want to refer to a series of uh, recommendations and inputs that we have coming out of this framing meeting and built around that as well. First of all, just a recommendation in terms of principles. And a lot of this is driven from paragraph 44 of the Global Compact itself, as well as the new um, TORs around the UN network. The principles are sort of four uh, that I can list out here. The first is that this should be built on a principle of partnership and the spirit of collaboration. Secondly, full inclusivity at all levels in all ways. Thirdly, a principle of transparency that the conduct of the UN network and all of its work should be done in the most open way uh, possible. 
And then fourthly, a common purpose, that the UN network should be driven by a common purpose, not just by members uh, of its agencies, but also with other non-UN stakeholders as well. And from this, we have a series of very specific programmatic as well as pragmatic um, sort of recommendations that have emerged. First of all, um, I'm quite happy to mention this first one. It has been widely, widely recommended and very strongly recommended that within the UN network that be a dedicated function for stakeholder engagement. A lot of this is actually built on the experience of my role in this last two years around the Global Compact. And, but just to break out this into some core elements of what this might look like, this function should be based on a partnership with civil society and other stakeholders in engagement with the UN network, and not just one based on a procedural relationship. The, the, the function should be done proactively and working directly with interlocutors, focal points, and coordinators of different stakeholders. And these already exist. When, we, when I mentioned earlier in the framing meeting, we had um, participants from NHRIs, from academia, uh, from the private sector, from trade unions, other society, there are already interlocutors, coordinators, focal points that convene a large segments of these stakeholders. So working with these people, these coordinators, is really essential in how we move forward in that discussion and how their engagement can be. So that's the first core recommendation that has been <coughs> widely and repeatedly mentioned uh, throughout uh, by all stakeholders. Secondly, uh, the Director General in the framing meeting itself also uh, referred to the possibility of convening a consultation early next year with stakeholders to talk about the UN network in much more detail and to roll up our sleeves and get down to the nitty gritty of what the mechanism of engagement would look like. This has been widely well received by all stakeholders and there's a lot of anticipation around this. So we, we really, really look forward to that. But just to break out in that as well, just some core pieces of recommendations uh, of what this could look like in, in general. Firstly, there has been strong encouragement to try to convene this within three or four months of next year. Not too early, not too late. I think beyond four, five, six months, uh, a lot of the core elements of the network might have been formed and be too late for stakeholders to give input into that a little bit too early and things might not be in place as well to have uh, ability to react to. So three or four months is sort of the, the timeline we're looking at that I think would make a lot of sense and that has been uh, recommended. And again, secondly, also to work directly with interlocutors, focal points and coordinators of different stakeholders in both not just participating in that consultation, but actually in the planning stages leading up to that consultation. Uh, in fact, there has been some proposals to form some kind of joint planning committee uh, with the UN network into designing how that consultation and that engagement could look like so that when we get to that, a lot of the work will already be in place. We can roll up our sleeves and get down to the real details of the work. So that's the second big sort of recommendation, that, that consultation. The third is actually participation. A lot of focus around participation in the UN network from stakeholders has revolved around working groups. I think this is where we understand is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, where business gets done. So there's been a lot of focus on different series of recommendations on how stakeholders can engage in the working groups, talking about participating as, you know, um, sort of advisory roles, uh, associate membership, um, as well as co-chairing different working groups um, and rotating with other stakeholders as well. A lot of this can actually be built around some existing mechanisms, uh, existing models of how this exists. IAC is one of those that has been repeatedly mentioned, uh, as well as even some of the workings of the GMG in the past. Fourth big recommendation that has really come out, and this is something that has been really underlined and extremely important, especially for a body like IOM, is around national and regional linkages and how this feeds into the global, uh, global workings of the UN network. It has been really repeatedly mentioned that work actually happens mostly on the ground in the field, and we need to draw upon that. In fact, most stakeholders operate at the field level at the regional and national levels. And this is where we need to draw from and not forget and not just have the same usual suspects on the international level as, as we welcome, but we must complement that with real robust engagement at the regional and national levels as well. How does civil society and other stakeholders work closely with country teams, regional coordinators, 
as well as the regional economic commissions and RCPs, are all questions that need to be addressed soon as we build up the UN network. And this can be done directly with representatives from and interlocutors, focal points and coordinators from those regional and national working, working groups and, and stakeholders as well. The fifth big recommendation is information sharing. This goes back to the principle of transparency. Um, information sharing should be something that's underlined throughout the workings of the UN network. Ongoing dialogues and consultations should be uh, put into place, but also a suggestion has emerged on how we could do a, a newsletter so that all civil society and stakeholders could be informed about the workings of the UN network and its progress. And then the sixth big recommendation that has also uh, emerged, and this is something that is, some, I think we should flag, uh, for, especially for member states as you implement different pieces of this. Civil society views our roles uh, in a very diverse format. There's, a, of course, you know civil society and other stakeholders have a broad sense of diversity uh, and experience and, and work. But also in how we view our role in the implementation of the Global Compact, as well as engagement with the UN network, there is a wide diversity on this. And I try to categorize into two distinct groups. One as co-implementers of the work, the actual work being done. But secondly, not to forget, as monitors, to review and see where there are gaps and where there are needs for better work, but also to see where there are good practices already in place and identify those and lift that up to be replicated in other contexts as well. My recommendation is really to embrace this diversity of roles in its entirety. I think we've seen throughout the, the negotiation process, but also going back to the consultation process and beyond, that the diversity of the roles that stakeholders play can actually add to the immense uh, richness of the work that we are about to embark on. And if we can encapsulate all of that in its entirety, we can really uh, implement this in its, its full richness. So again, we want to emphasize that we should really try to embrace uh, the monitoring role that civil society sees itself playing as well as the co-implementation role. And finally, my closing remark is actually looking towards the civil society side of things uh, and to reflect on some of the development already happening on that side as well, which sort of mirrors the development around the UN network. And one in particular is around the Civil Society Action Committee, which has been in operation um, since the high-level summit and throughout the global compact process and both global compact processes in this last two years. The Civil Society Action Committee is undertaking a very detailed assessment and review process, looking at the structure of civil society engagement around migration policy matters, and very, very directly focused on the UN network. This will lead into a 2019 restructuring of how civil society engages at all levels, the global, regional, national levels, and around all work related to migration. This is something I think we should be uh, looking very closely at and supporting in every way we can, because I think this development that follows the same development of the UN network is going to be so complementary that the engagement will actually be fit for purpose uh, in the UN network more than anything else. So it's something I'm very quietly confident and very, very excited about as well that we should look to uh, in the coming years. Um, but in particularly in next year, I think this will be the turning point uh, of this new era. And I, I think we really look forward for stakeholder engagement in the UN network and in all work related to migration. Thank you very much, Colin. And uh, let me just briefly underscore some few points from the IOM side. Um, IOM, like <coughs> the majority of the UN entities, is an intergovernmental organization. And therefore, our main task is first and foremost uh, to service uh, our, our member states, all of you. While the UN network is comprised only of uh, UN entities, the judge of its effectiveness ultimately will be the extent to which it serves all of you in the implementation of the Global Compact and in your addressing your needs. IOM will continue to be uh, a very responsive, eff eff efficient and effective operational partner to governments and other stakeholders, both here at headquarters and primarily through our field offices throughout the world. 
working directly with you to improve the management of migration and the lives of migrants. IOM will partner with, other, uh, with others where it makes sense to do so, and the network, I think, provides a very strong opportunity to deepen that cooperation across the board. Our intention is to couple that operational effectiveness with an enhanced ability to leverage the pre-existing expertise and capacities of the UN systems, system, as well as IOM own extensive work on the ground at the local, national, uh, regional, and global levels. To do so, a small UN network, migration network secretariat staff will be created here at headquarters. I, I'm a, and I'm encouraging uh, the other members of the network executive committee, and we have done do so with the, with the director general, to consider loaning experts to that secretariat, both to share the responsibility for the network, but also to bring a genuine spirit of solidarity to its work. The new policy hub that was outlined by our director general yesterday will also be able to inform the work of the network by drawing together knowledge and expertise across IOM. Now more than ever, I think that you need an IOM that brings its full knowledge and expertise to support our collective efforts to manage migration more effectively and more humanely. Now let me open the floor. I know that there have been a lot of questions about the network from our membership. So you have the best person here <laughs> to respond to all those questions. Uh, and uh, I think it's an opportunity that you should not miss. So the floor is open for questions. Uh, Ethiopia. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, our moderator, Ms. Thompson. Uh, I wish to thank first the IOM for organizing this important panel. I wish also to extend my appreciation to Madam Arbour and Mr. Colleen for their uh, presentations, which I found them to be very informal and informative with regard to the knowledge um, that I have about the UN Migration Network and the Framing Conference that was held here in Geneva last October. As we all recall, there was a persistent call from member states and other st stakeholders during the negotiations of the impact over the compact that whole of a society and whole of a government approach should be complemented with the whole of UN approach to avoid fragmentation and at times overlapping and competing support of the different UN agencies. There was also a strong call for capacity building to developing countries to effectively address the myriad of migration management challenges, which ultimately reflected in the document with the establishment of the capacity building mechanism. In that regard, I believe uh, that it's encouraging to note that there is a progress in responding to these questions with the establishment of UN migration network and capacity building mechanism. I want to take this opportunity to appreciate Madam Harbour's work and her office for the progress made in the preparation of the terms of reference and the initial composition of the members of our membership leading to an early working plan for, of cross-cutting issues. Let me finally ask two questions. The first is the UN Migration Network being a successor of GMC in a sense that whatever uh, the experience uh, in the operational experience of GMC JMG have in the past, to what extent this has informed uh, the working of the functions of the, uh, the UN uh, Migration Network. And secondly, um, I heard that uh, Ms. Arbo said uh, there is a linkage between uh, this migration network 
as well as the uh, capacity building mechanism, but we'd be very happy to know a little bit how it's going to work uh, in terms of concrete uh, example, if there is a possibility. Uh, in particular, we are very much interested as the capacity building me uh, mechanism is to support developing countries to address various challenges of migration. In particular, again, uh, with Africa, uh, since we have in Africa this um, the uh, free movement of protocol and also the Ogadogo action plan on human trafficking among others. These are, I think, directly related to migration issues. So to what extent the network is within the context of the capacity building mechanism will address these issues. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I give the floor now to Philippines. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, at the very beginning, let me uh, convey our profound appreciation for the continued leadership of our SRSG and to our uh, colleagues in the IOM for the important contributions they have been making. Uh, we would like to express our appreciation for uh, this briefing. Uh, we are relieved that uh, in its conceptualization, it is entirely in line with the service to member states orientation of the IOM, which we are uh, informed will not be affected, but will be a metric by which to uh, adjudge the success of uh, the network. We are hopeful furthermore that the network uh, is, will be a very potent mechanism for doing away with uh, the silos that very much uh, has characterized some of the work of uh, the UN in this field and other fields, a way of flattening the uh, management and decision-making processes. Um, I am also concerned with the point that was raised by our good friend, the ambassador of uh, Ethiopia and our uh, chairperson about uh, the interaction uh, with states. Uh, we are confident that uh, this can be worked out, but it's a question of uh, advising us uh, how we will move forward. Um, there is a, I, I read somewhere also some provision uh, or invitation for secondment uh, by other agencies. Uh, if this applies to states, uh, how, how would this impact uh, developing countries that do not have the funds? but have perhaps the personnel to uh, share. And finally, we are looking forward to uh, moving the process forward in Marrakesh. Marrakesh is, for this purpose, is, is the starting line. So uh, we, we look forward to working together with uh, all those concerned. Once again, thank you very much to all those who have contributed uh, to this panel and to the ongoing work of our nascent network. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Romania, you have the floor. SRSG, Luis Arbour. This is Deputy Director General Thompson, Mr. Rajak, Excellency, distinguished delegates. I speak on behalf of the following group of countries, Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, the Netherlands, Portugal, my own country, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. The Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration to be adopted in a few days' time in Marrakesh, while acknowledging specific national approaches with respect to it, can contribute to strengthening the international response to migration flows and to moving towards a more sustainable management of migration. We should work together to ensure that migration is safe, orderly, and regular, as well as human and sustainable, and in the interest of the countries of origin, transit, and destination. We truly believe that the positive impact of migration can only be harnessed if migration is well managed and if irregular migration is significantly reduced. 
In a highly interdependent world, migration can only be addressed through international cooperation in accordance with international law. Migration is a global phenomenon that requires appropriate regional, interregional, and global cooperation and solutions based on the principles of solidarity and shared responsibility. We welcome the decision of the Secretary General to establish a new UN network on migration, which we view as a successor of Global Migration Group, and we are looking forward to its official launch in the margins of the Marrakesh Intergovernmental Conference. We are pleased to note that IOM will serve as a coordinator and secretary of the all constituent parts of the network. We welcome as well the establishment of the executive committee of the UN Migration Network, supported by the clear working principle as well as time-bound and objectives-driven working groups and the capacity building mechanism. We also welcome recent developments pertaining to the migration network and the public publication of the terms of reference and look forward to learning more details about the network's structure. Secretariat and working groups, in particular with regards to the network's role in relation to the capacity building mechanism. The IOM remains a crucial partner and we expect even further intensified cooperation with the UN Migration Network in partnerships with all the organizations, including the SRSG's office, and with respect for specific mandates and roles. We expect the network to enable us to have a more 360 degree view on migration and solidly engage with all relevant stakeholders. And we look forward to hearing more about the means by which member states will be able to inform and influence the work of the UN Migration Network. So far, the IOM has delivered solid work in supporting the GSM process. We are looking forward to learn more about the outcome of this collective effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Romania. Uh, Morocco, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Directrice Générale Adjointe. Je vous... Et je m'excuse. Je voudrais remercier nos deux panélistes pour leurs interventions très instructives, très détaillées, et qui nous donnent un aperçu important sur le travail qui nous attend dans notre interaction avec le réseau sur la migration. Mais je voudrais me limiter, vous avez dit, Madame la Directrice générale adjointe, que effectivement nous avons beaucoup de questions, je voudrais me limiter à un seul aspect, abordé d'ailleurs par Madame Arbour dans son intervention, qui, qui lit la question de la migration au développement. Comme on le sait, aujourd'hui, les transferts des migrants, du point de vue de leur volume financier, dépassent, et j'allais dire de loin, l'aide octroyée au titre de la coopération pour le développement. Il s'agit donc d'un levier très important qui peut aider les États qui le souhaitent dans leur coopération pour la gestion du phénomène migratoire, qui peut aider ces États à se consacrer aux causes réelles qui poussent un certain nombre de populations vers la migration, et en particulier les populations qui euh, se trouvent dans une situation de migration forcée. Je veux dire par là qu'une bonne gestion des transferts occasionnés par les migrants vers leur pays d'origine peuvent être utilisé, exploité pour le développement de régions dont sont issus les migrants dits illégaux. Le constat qui a été établi jusqu'au jour d'aujourd'hui, c'est que ces transferts sont essentiellement consacrés vers des dépenses sociales dans les pays d'origine, qui sont naturellement très nécessaires. Mais il s'agit aujourd'hui de réfléchir et de planifier pour que ces transferts soient également euh, traduits vers des investissements productifs qui pourraient jouer un rôle important dans l'assèchement des zones d'immigration de, euh, clandestine et aussi pour la coopération euh, entre les pays d'origine 
et de destination. Il en va de même pour ce qui concerne naturellement l'exploitation des hautes compétences des migrants dans les pays de destination, qui pourraient jouer un rôle très important dans la planification et la réalisation de ces investissements productifs. C'est pour ça que nous estimons, sans vouloir entrer dans les détails dès à présent, que le réseau qui, qui est mis en place, grâce à sa constitution de compétences variées et diverses des différentes agences des Nations Unies, pourrait jouer un rôle très important euh, dans euh, cette politique, dans cette gestion réussie de la migration liée au développement. Et en particulier, en associant euh, au travail du réseau les secteurs, le secteur privé dans les différents pays concernés, c'est en particulier les pays d'origine et aussi de destination. Et je pense ici en particulier au secteur bancaire qui peut jouer un rôle très important. Nous savons aussi aujourd'hui qu'il y a des prélèvements significatifs sur ces transferts des migrants vers leur pays d'origine. C'est-à-dire que le système bancaire agit dans euh, ces opérations et nous souhaitons qu'il puisse aussi agir dans la formation de compétences et, la, et surtout l'élaboration et le soutien au projet d'investissement productif des migrants. Voilà donc ce que j'avais à dire, Madame la directrice générale adjointe. Et surtout, en conclusion, j'aimerais poser une petite question à Madame Arbour. Est-ce qu'elle considère que le réseau a pour tâche également de, de définir une stratégie allant dans ce sens, allant dans le sens de l'exploitation, euh, d'une meilleure exploitation des transferts des migrants euh, du point de vue économique vers leur pays d'origine Et je vous remercie. Je vous remercie, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. And now I give the floor to Canada. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the panelists for their uh, helpful interventions. Uh, I wanted to ask a question uh, to the IOM uh, generally about uh, costs, costs of implementation. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to say that um, a Special Representative uh, Arbour's tracing of the uh, evolution of where we are Um, of how we got to where we are in terms of the international migration debate uh, is, is very instructive. And when you think about that trajectory that we've been on, uh, it's very clear that the fact that, that we now have the IOM in a place where it's become a related agency, that it's been identified as the coordinator of the network, um, it, it's almost clear that even without the global compacts, we were on the trajectory for this to happen for the IOM in any event, which is, which is good news uh, and which is appropriate because we do need that kind of function uh, to be played within the UN system. Um, and, and even if it hadn't been for the Global Compacts, we would be here, but we do have the Global Compact, so even more, that, that role is even, even more important. And when we think about things like the establishment of the policy hub, that uh, the Deputy uh, Director General mentioned. When we think about the establishment of the network, these are very, very important functions in order to support uh, all of us in terms of uh, our own uh, management of migration. So the questions uh, that we have, uh, and we don't necessarily need answers today, but we would like the IOM to reflect on this and to get back to us with some answers is, What exactly will be the costs to the IOM of putting these functions in place? What is the most effective way of funding these functions? And how will we measure the success of what we've put in place uh, once these functions are in place and up and running? Uh, we hope, uh, Canada hopes, that countries will use the Global Compact on Migration as leverage. They will leverage what's in there to make Uh, changes to their own systems. Obviously, it's entirely the decision of, of individual countries, but we know, for example, in Canada, that by having pathways for permanent uh, residents in our country, uh, we've, we've been able to contribute to our own tax base, contribute to our, our own wealth as a country. We know that pathways for temporary residents have helped fill labor market shortages that we have in various sectors uh, across our country. And that has been helpful as well. Uh, we invest about $1 billion a year in settlement and integration services 
we don't do this purely out of altruism or purely to help people who need this help. We do it because it's an investment. With more effective integration, newcomers to Canada are able to integrate more effectively into our economy and again, create income for themselves and for our country. So we're hoping that other countries uh, that don't necessarily have these services or these functions in place might want to consider uh, taking these on, putting these uh, services in place. Again, they'll, they'll benefit migrants to your countries, but they'll benefit your countries too. So uh, hopefully with that impetus, there'll be some interest in countries in making these investments themselves, getting the expertise from the IOM to put these systems in place, but there will nonetheless be costs for the IOM. And so that's where I come back to that original question in terms of what are the costs, what is the best way to fund those things, and how will we measure the outcomes? Thank you. Thank you very much, Canada. Um, Ecuador, tiene la palabra. Gracias, señora presidenta. Queremos agradecer a los panelistas, a los panelistas por la eh, exposición muy clara que se ha realizado eh, previamente y por la actualización sobre la red sobre migración de las Naciones Unidas. Ahora que nos aproximamos a la adopción del Pacto Mundial para una Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular, hablar de su implementación es crucial para llevar a la práctica sus objetivos en beneficio de los migrantes y de los países de origen, tránsito y destino. El Ecuador acoge con satisfacción el nuevo rol de la OIM como Secretaría y Coordinadora de, la, de esta red. La experiencia en el terreno de la OIM y su liderazgo en el ámbito de la migración será de gran aporte y ayuda para seguir mejorando la coordinación en temas de migración dentro del sistema de las Naciones Unidas y ofrecer un apoyo efectivo y coherente a todo el sistema en la implementación y revisión del pacto. En este sentido, creemos que la OIM se encuentra en una posición de liderazgo única para ofrecer un enfoque multisectorial tan necesario para la discusión de políticas, la asociación, la colaboración, el intercambio de experiencias y la movilización de recursos para facilitar la gobernanza de la migración a nivel global, regional y nacional, o sea, internamente en los estados. Consideramos que el grupo de trabajo relativo a las relaciones entre la OIM y Naciones Unidas y las cuestiones conexas podría ser el espacio para informar a los estados de manera regular y continua la labor de la OIM dentro de la red. Señora Presidenta, la red deberá contribuir al logro de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. En este sentido, quiero resaltar el trabajo que ha venido realizando el Foro Global de Migración y Desarrollo, particularmente su contribución al logro de los OEDS específicos y relacionados con la migración. El Ecuador, al asumir la presidencia del foro el, el año venidero, en el 2019, impulsará las herramientas existentes como la Plataforma para Alianzas, que contiene más de mil prácticas en, mat en materia de migración y desarrollo y fortalecerá el potencial de esta herramienta como un mecanismo que permita interacciones presenciales enfocadas en compartir experiencias entre Estados y socios clave. Esto representa una oportunidad sin precedentes para fomentar las capacidades de los Estados, lo que permitirá que basen sus acciones en información técnica debidamente procesada y no en percepciones políticas. De esta manera, 
podremos delinear políticas a mediano y largo plazo que permitan aprovechar los beneficios de la migración en el desarrollo de todos los estados de origen, de tránsito y de destino. Adicionalmente, el foro ha venido trabajando a través de asociaciones estratégicas regionales y globales, las cuales están claramente identificadas en el pacto. En este sentido, el foro prevé un espacio amplio, informal y flexible para el establecimiento de asociaciones estratégicas, la construcción de consensos y la creación de sinergias. Por lo tanto, el Ecuador considera que el foro puede aportar de manera sustantiva al trabajo de la red. Confiamos en un futuro más ambicioso y sólido de la gobernanza internacional de las migraciones, que repercuta en favor de la defensa de los derechos de todos los migrantes mediante, entre otras, la construcción de una narrativa más positiva de la migración. Quisiera eh, expresar una pregunta para la señora Harbour. ¿Cómo se conformaría el grupo de trabajo y de qué manera identificará las prioridades de este grupo con los integrantes y representantes de los países miembros? Muchas gracias. Gracias, Ecuador. Eh, la Francia, le debe la palabra. France, party. Okay. Then, not having any other requests for the floor, for the floor, I will start giving the the floor to Ms. Arbour to respond to the majority of the questions that were for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Many questions uh, dealt with the functioning of the network, so I'm going to try to address them sort of in a comprehensive fashion. Right at the outset, the first question that was put to me in that regard was, in a sense, what is the difference between this new network and the Global Migration Group, which some of you may recall was called at the outset the Geneva Migration Group. It started with the Geneva-based agencies and then expanded. There are many, many ways uh, in which it is meant to be different structurally, and I really hope that, in fact, the deliverables will make it clear that it's a, a, a very different way of doing business, I think, uh, for the UN. The, the Global Migration Group, as of now, was comprised of 22 agencies. So it had reached a critical mass that made it, I think, very difficult to operate, for instance, without a smaller executive committee. Um, the network, I think, will have a, an even larger uh, membership, but with a very, very dedicated executive capacity comprised as presently uh, constituted of eight members, the ones that have the most direct day-to-day -day, uh, set of activities related to migration. But it will draw on a much larger constituency and, of course, will reach out to other stakeholders through the formation of the working groups. So structurally, I think it's going to be very different. It's going to be a larger network, but with a core functioning executive committee that will make it, I hope, much more agile. The second characteristic is that it now um, is not only a sort of internal administrative mechanism of the UN, it is infused with mandates from member states through the Global Compact. Um, and in fact, it is uh, in its structure, it will be able to house essentially the capacity building mechanism that the Global Compact calls for. This is the capacity building mechanism, which I've described. You remember it's there in the Compact. There's a knowledge platform, a connection hub, and very importantly, a startup fund. All this will be, in a sense, administered uh, by the network. Let me say a few things about the startup fund because, as is often the case, the, the, the funding is a pretty critical aspect of um, the work, the, the operations of the network. The startup fund uh, contemplates, obviously, um, contributions, 
uh, to a fund that will require, as all the trust funds in the United Nations, a governance structure. That governance structure will be composed, again, as is the case in all these trust funds, of UN member states and stakeholders uh, forming uh, the oversight of the, of the fund and will be administered by uh, the MPTF office, the multi-partner trust funds office in the, in the UN, which has, I think, a very transparent and well-known method of, of uh, uh, operating these funds. This will be supported by the network secretariat. So the, the, the trust fund is a separate entity, but it will be housed with the capacity building, in the capacity building mechanism that the network, uh, I think, will be operating. I think this will give coordination much, much more meaning than the global migration group ever had. This will really be the network, will be the front door. The one thing I want to stress at the outset, though, is that I think in creating the network, we were all very conscious of ensuring that there's no suggestion of the network overtaking any of the mandates of its uh, contributing members. There's no suggestion that all of a sudden this network should overtake the specific uh, activ mandate, activities, tasks that are currently performed very well by independent agencies. What I think it will aim to do is reduce the considerable duplication of activities when coordination is not as intense as I hope it will be in the network. There are lots of initiatives uh, that are where member state or UN country teams, for instance, knock on different doors, and after the fact, we realize that there are all kinds of projects that are very similar to each other, quite duplicative. The network should be able to really resolve that and therefore produce considerable uh, efficiencies in the system. And it should so also strive to identify the few areas where collective action uh, is vastly preferable and will have more impact um, than anything within the single mandate of, uh, of, of one of the participating <laughs> entities. This will be work in progress, but I think with with a, a real secretariat housed in IOM, um, this, will become, uh, this will become a reality. The working groups will be key, but certainly speaking for myself, and I hope that this idea will um, generate some traction in the, in the secretariat and in, and in the executive committee of the network, certainly at the outset, I think they should be uh, few rather than too many working groups. They should not be duplicative of the existing silos that we're trying to dismantle. We should not, in my view, have working groups that will just invite the reconstitution of silos. So they should be um, practical, time-limited, focused on results, uh, closely, closely monitored. And if they're not delivering, they should be set aside in favor of other initiatives. So I think this will be a way of measuring the added value of operating through working groups. The worst scenario to me would be these kind of permanent standing working groups that will have no particular timelines for producing anything and will tend to, to, to be thematic on, on a very large basis. Um, the working groups, actually, and I'll come to the question of remittances that was used. This is an example. It's an issue that comes uh, often. I think it's been extensively studied, particularly the question of the cost of transfer of remittances. The World Bank has done a lot of work on that. There are other aspects of remittances uh, that, that are problematic. For instance, the importance and therefore, to some extent, the dependence uh, of some countries of origin on the scale of remittances that in some cases add up to 20, 25% of GDP um, may create a lot of fragility if, if there's no, as there never is, the uh, uh, accurate projections of the likelihood of that stream of income coming in um, being likely to be in place in the future. There are lots of aspects also regarding how better use could be made of money that, that uh, 
constitutes so much of income in some countries, and yet is channeled, it seems, for the most part for individual use in families for education, for housing, for health care, and whether they are ways of harvesting larger benefits um, for development. Lots of these issues, I think. Honestly, there's not a single UN agency today that has the capacity to look at all of these issues. The World Bank may have specific expertise on the question of reducing the cost of transfers, but others, UNDP for instance, um, might come in with a, a lot more uh, capacity to uh, um, think of initiatives that will increase the development potential uh, of, uh, of this, this stream of income in uh, developing countries. So these are examples, I think, of how working groups should be formed. The trust fund, of course, will be available to support the capacity building mechanism, which, to which um, a multiplicity of partners can uh, make calls. So member states, country teams uh, will present, presumably, projects to, um, to be supported by this uh, trust fund as part of the the capacity building mechanism that the Global Compact uh, contemplates. Um, so the design of the fund, I think, will be clearly to prioritize responsiveness to the needs at country and regional level. I don't think it's contemplated that should be, again, a source of income for thematic think tanks through the working groups. It's meant to be designed as genuine capacity building at national uh, uh, regional, sub-regional levels. It will presumably uh, prioritize also initiatives that are based on partnerships to maximize its effectiveness um, and will be available, I think, for any initiatives that are uh, anchored in the Global Compact, which frankly represents just about any possible initiative linked to international migration. Um, The, the composition of the Secretariat, I think uh, it's going to be very much for IOM and the network to look at what, are, what will be the needs. They may, uh, it may be difficult to anticipate right at the outset what kind of staffing will be required. I think there's, uh, and Laura mentioned, a call on the UN partners to contribute through secondment of personnel uh, and in some other ways, again, to, to, to try to help bring this working method together and minimize uh, the cost of, of staffing the secretariat. I think this will be within the, at the beginning of next year, I think we'll have a pretty clear sense of, uh, of how this will be uh, um, staffed and supported. Um, so I've spoken about remittances. This was one specific uh, issue that has been, I think, very present throughout the consultations and negotiations of the Global Compact, and certainly one where I would hope the network will be able to produce uh, deliverables. Um, yeah, so I think I've touched on the composition and priorities of the working group, I think is going to be probably the first order of business uh, of the network, and as I said, in the conversation in the leading to the adoption of the terms of reference, all agencies coming together, I think there is a common sense that uh, nobody wants a very heavy structure and, and with very sort of abstract uh, uh, mandates. And we're going to look at the outset, I think, of trying to be able to measure the effectiveness of this new way of cooperating, consolidating, uh, and coordinating UN activities. Thank you, Luis. Uh, a couple of things that were directly asked to, uh, to IOM. First of all, uh, I think we, what we are clear is that the objective that we have with the network is to leverage the capacities of the UN system. And as a result of that, what we have felt in IOM is that as part of the Secretariat, we will need, obviously, uh, staff from IOM, but also staff from other agencies. And that's the call for secondment that we, that we have made secondments from UN agencies so that we have the expertise of a, a variety of entities uh, in, uh, in, within the Secretariat. And I think that's going to be extremely important. We have uh, had that discussion with 
other agencies and, and uh, we are hopeful and, and I would say optimistic that they will respond positively to that request. Um, I think, uh, well, as a, with regard to the costs, uh, the, the Director General was very clear when he made his statement that, that this is a, a transitional budget for him. Uh, and uh, I think there, there are going to be costs uh, uh, related to, to this. Um, we have obviously identified the coordination function that, that will have to happen not only here uh, at headquarters level, but also at the ground uh, in the field and because of the projectized nature of IOM, uh, that will uh, certainly be an issue to be addressed in the future, how to have that coordination role incorporated into uh, the terms of reference and, and responsibilities of our chief of missions at the, at the country level. The secretariat also will be, uh, will be a, a, an additional cost. We, uh, the DG said very clearly that he's starting with a very small logic and uh, the hope is that we put some uh, staff members from IOM. Uh, as Luis said, something small that is not, we are not intending to create a huge structure uh, behind the network, but it's a, a very small thing. And hopefully, as I said before, with the secondment of several uh, other agencies, staff from other agencies. Uh, the policy hub, uh, you cannot connect totally the policy hub with the network because, uh, and, and certainly with the, G, G, uh, with the global compact, uh, because this is a, a need that is independent, I would say, uh, of, of the network, but I, it's certainly going to be informing uh, the work of the network, and I think uh, it will be also uh, an eventual uh, cost for the future. Again, I don't equate that to the network, uh, but, but it's an important uh, element to add. Uh, and certainly there will be other things like uh, the knowledge uh, platform, the connection hub that will require some technical expertise. We will see, uh, again, it's something that I think we are at a very early stage uh, at this point. Uh, as as uh, Luis said, we, we have not established working groups. We, we, we have to really look at what, what is coming, how the organizations are going to be working together, what are going to be the requirements uh, for IOM specifically as the secretariat and the coordinator. And once we have a clear idea on that, we will come back to you on costs. And we are hoping that uh, uh, there will be, um, uh, I think we, we received very positive messages already of several countries encouraging us to bring the, the, the potential cost to them and, and discuss how to cover those costs in the future. And I think that there is a good, um, um, a, a good, a positive um, look at, at those things uh, for the future. Um, with regard to the other question was about um, the discussion about how to keep informed member states. I think, uh, well, there is, first of all, uh, a report that the network is going to be doing, correct me, Luis, if I'm wrong, uh, to uh, the Secretary General in order for him to report to the General Assembly um, about the work of the network. So, so that is, I think, one first element. Uh, certainly, uh, at, as IOM, we will keep uh, all of you informed uh, through either uh, the working group uh, with uh, uh, IOM-UN relations or uh, other uh, venues that we have, like the Council and the SCPF. Certainly, is going to be one of the things that we will keep member states informed. Um, I know that there is La France de Retour, so uh, I will give you the floor. <laughs> Bonjour et merci beaucoup. Je dois d'abord représenter vraiment toutes mes excuses d'avoir soulevé ma pancarte et d'avoir quitté la salle, mais comme on dit, il y avait une urgence. Donc, encore une fois, toutes mes excuses. En tout cas, je me joins à, aux autres délégations qui sont exprimées pour remercier et l'OIM et la représentante spéciale pour le travail qui a été accompli hein, depuis 2016 et notamment la constitution de ce réseau-là. Euh, ma délégation ne répétera pas ce qu'elle a déjà dit lors du, de, du discours général hier sur la légitimité 
et l'attente que nous avons lorsqu'il s'agit de l'Organisation de internationale des migrations pour l'immigration pour être le coordinateur pertinent et légitime et le secrétariat de ce réseau. Je vais joindre mon, 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 mon questionnement à celles qui, ou en tout le moins aux questions qui ont déjà été posées par d'autres délégations, notamment euh, par le Canada sur les coûts, donc je ne vais pas me répéter sur cela. Je vais également féliciter la Roumanie qui a fait une déclaration euh, dans laquelle euh, mon pays se reconnaît entièrement et totalement. J'espère que le fait d'avoir quitté la salle ne m'oblige pas pas à répondre ou à répéter des questions qui ont été posées, mais j'aimerais avoir une précision sur l'articulation qu'il y aura de fait entre le réseau tel que nous l'attendons et le réseau humanitaire, puisque j'ai cru comprendre de l'envoyé spécial qu'il y aura une distinction qu'il faudra faire. Et ma question concerne notamment les initiatives qui seront prises pour éviter les doublons et les duplications pour parler un mauvais français. En outre, une autre question que j'aimerais poser concerne le comité exécutif. Euh, bien sûr, il n'appartient pas aux États peut-être de rentrer dans ce détail-là, vous me direz, je, sais pas, je ne sais pas vraiment, mais j'ai remarqué qu'il y avait des organisations qui pourraient avoir une pertinence et qui n'y figurent pas, par exemple, et pour suivre le programme de, du Conseil demain et cet après-midi, je ne vois pas la présence d'une organisation comme l'EMS qui pourrait avoir euh, une pertinence. Et j'aimerais savoir si c'est un choix lié au mandat de l'OMS ou si c'est parce qu'il a été considéré que sa présence n'était pas nécessaire ou euh, pertinente au sein du, du comité exécutif. Merci à vous. Je vous remercie. Oui. oui. Alors, merci beaucoup. Euh, on a déjà eu beaucoup de discussions avec les autres réseaux existants aux Nations Unies, entre autres dans le secteur humanitaire, mais également dans le secteur du développement, pour s'assurer précisément que le réseau en matière de migration ne va pas euh, usurper des fonctions qui sont maintenant bien installées dans ces deux secteurs-là, dans le secteur du développement et en particulier dans le, dans le domaine humanitaire. Alors, je pense qu'il va y avoir une très, très bonne... Euh, coordination entre le réseau sur la migration, qui a quand même une vocation euh, en matière de migration, où le secteur humanitaire est un aspect, mais pas le seul, et d'ailleurs probablement pas l'aspect le, le plus dominant. Je pense qu'il y a des questions de développement, questions économiques, euh, il y a beaucoup d'autres aspects. Alors, on est très conscient de l'existence d'un réseau qui fonctionne très bien en matière d'activité humanitaire, et euh, l'agilité avec laquelle les acteurs du secteur humanitaire peuvent œuvrer à travers ce réseau va être entièrement respectée. On va être en très bon contact avec eux. D'ailleurs, AESI est membre, est un membre du réseau sur la migration. On va être en très bon contact avec eux. Euh, et comme je vous dis, la même chose en matière de développement. Il ne faut pas non plus avoir un dédoublement d'activité des acteurs en matière de développement qui ont leur propre réseau et des acteurs en matière de migration. Euh, la question du, de la composition du comité exécutif du réseau euh, a été une question très difficile. On a commencé avec un comité préparatoire. En fait, on avait choisi à ce moment-là pour ne porter aucun jugement de valeur sur l'éventuelle composition d'un comité exécutif. On avait choisi les organismes qui étaient mentionnés dans la déclaration de New York. Et ça, ça comprenait de toute évidence les acteurs les plus impliqués en matière euh, en matière de migration. Ces mêmes acteurs se retrouvent dans le comité exécutif. Les seuls qui y ont été ajoutés, dans une certaine mesure, c'est l'UNICEF. Euh, il y a eu des intérêts exprimés par d'autres. La préoccupation, bien sûr, c'était de ne pas sombrer dans ce qui a été finalement euh, une des lourdeurs du Global Migration Group, c'était d'avoir un groupe trop élargi et donc pas très agile, euh, plus difficile à manœuvrer. Déjà huit euh, entités comme membres d'un comité exécutif, c'était plus peut-être qu'on aurait voulu le faire au début. Euh, UNDESA représente en fait le secrétariat. Euh, les autres sont les acteurs qui étaient nommés dans la déclaration de New York et qui sont, moi je pense, les, les, 
des acteurs les plus impliqués en matière de migration. Et c'est sûr qu'il y en a d'autres, mais leur participation, ils auront par exemple l'opportunité soit de présider un des groupes de travail, ça, ça va être une des façons dont leur expertise pourrait être mise à disposition. Et on a bien mentionné que la formation du comité exécutif est la formation initiale. Alors, je pense qu'il sera loisible euh, au réseau de revoir à terme euh, l'efficacité de son comité exécutif et d'en changer la composition s'il y a lieu. Peut-être que certains membres voudront, qui seront moins actifs voudront s'en s'en dégager et d'autres pourront s'y joindre. Alors, ça reflète en fait, euh, je pense, les, les implications euh, euh, des entités euh, les plus concernées. Merci. Thank you, Louise. Well, uh, taking into account the time, that brings us to the, to the end. So I would like to thank very much Louise Arbour, uh, first of all, for two years of Uh, intense work, uh, and uh, it has been a pleasure working with you, you. and uh, personally and professionally. And we look forward to seeing you in uh, Marrakesh. And Colin, that uh, has been also a very active partner, uh, and that has helped us to, to bring civil society into all these discussions. Uh, thanks to all of you for, for having joined us. Uh, we have Uh, before this cl closing this panel, I would like to invite all of you to the side event that is happening in this very room at 13.30 in half an hour uh, on advancing the migration health research agenda for evidence-informed policy and practice. I hope that you can join us on the discussion and uh, have a nice lunch for those that uh, uh, are not going to join us. Uh, we will get together again back at three o'clock here with uh, a panel on health. Thank you very much, and this session is adjourned.